Okay, we're going to give a bit of time, just a few more seconds. Sure. And hello, everyone. We are so excited here today because today is a very, very special um, session here with Tara Shannon. Tara Shannon. I'm so sorry, Tara. <laughs> um, I just want to kind of, um, first of all, wish you a very happy Juneteenth um, and a reminder that please support Black businesses, especially today, and uh, Black-owned organizations, um, and, uh, you know, just kind of um, support as much as you can. And um, then I'm going to start off with um, an introduction to kind theory. Um, and um, so most of you, if uh, you already don't know about kind theory, um, we are a nonprofit organization in Texas area. And we use the insight and knowledge of neurodivergent people. We organize um, uh, events, um, educational events and projects. We educate organizations, institutions, and the general public about neurodiversity, accessibility, and disability rights as these relate to autism and ADHD. And so how we started was um, we've been a diverse group of parents, professionals, community members, and friends uh, by, by the knowledge that neurodivergent people deserve better. Um, we're all neurodivergent ourselves, and whether through our own lived experiences with autism and ADHD or through witnessing the struggles of our children, students, and clients, each member of our team knows all too well about how deficit-focused deficit resources lead to the stigmatization and exclusion of these important members of our communities. So we thought it's time for a paradigm shift, um, and here comes neurodiversity. So we knew our communities needed resources about autism and ADHD that could foster connection, inclusion, and empowerment for all our neurotypes. So we set out to create them. So this is what we do. Um, and we know that we can make our community a kinder and more welcoming place for all through our lived experiences. Um, as far as Tara is concerned, I don't even think that she needs an introdu introduction. <laughs> Uh, but um, just to kind of formally introduce her, Tara's, Shan uh, Tara's nickname, um, if you all don't already know, it was Bear, and it took on a whole new identity. And four years ago, she began drawing rabbits and bears, and her sketches turned into powerful and tender moments of conversation and reflection between the two illustrated characters. Rabbit and Bear became her outlet for years and years of thoughts, anxiety, depression, grief, magic, and wonder. And one day, to Tara's surprise, one of her sketches went viral on social media, leading to the growth of an entire community of rabbit and bear readers and fans. So starting off, um, Tara, and I know that this is kind of um, like a spontaneous question, um, but who is Bear? Um, well, Bear is me. Um, <laughs> but it's also, um, everybody that I, I've kind of met throughout my life. Um, you know, my parents, um, my grandparents, um, they all sort of, uh, teachers, um, doctors I've had, therapists, they all, um, make their way into, into bear and rabbit too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there bear is a is a culmination of of a variety of of people that I've met throughout my life, and um, when I started uh, losing, um, you know, important people from my life, like um, when my you know lost my my dad and then my mom, and then I was found myself kind of on my own dealing with some very big things. Um, and I didn't have those people to go and talk to. Um, that's when that's when uh, Bear and Rabbit um, were there for me. So, yeah. So. so, I have kind of like a spontaneous question leading off of this question now. Um, yeah. At the time when you started illustrating Bear as a character. Did you have an idea about your own neurodivergence? I I had, let me see, when I started that, 
Yes. At that point, it was starting to to kind of solidify. <laughs> I've okay. always I've always kind of wondered, <laughs> but okay. yeah, yeah. So. Okay. So moving on. Mm-hmm. If you were to describe yourself in your own words, in a single sentence, what would it be? Um, uh, always wanting to learn and um, strive to better myself, I suppose. Just um, it's maybe not very eloquent, <laughs> like a rabbit and a bear, but um, just just wanting to to continue learning because I've it's not one sentence I suppose but um in fig learning about myself I've I've uh I've learned better ways to cope in this world kind of on my own and um and I've become more comfortable with with me and I've, I've found answers to those questions and those things I always wondered about so um just learning, questioning. <laughs> I think uh, that's the thing about authors. Um, they, <clears throat> I'm sorry, hold on. That's a, huh? I have kind of a sore throat today. Well, Not a good day to have a sore throat. But no. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You have a drink there? You need a drink of water? <laughs> I have actually um, herbal green tea oh. to help with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I'm so sorry for this, but yeah, moving on. Um, I know that now, knowing now that you are neurodivergent, um, would you like to share some of your childhood experiences, good or bad, um, kind of the experiences that, you know, reflect now that you were neurodivergent throughout your life? Mm -hmm. Um, I very much felt like I didn't um, fit in <laughs> um, at all. And so my, like, the first memory that I have, um, and it has me wondering now about a variety of things, but the very first sort of memory that I have is um, as, it, as I was two, two years old, <laughs> which <laughs> some people would be like, you can't remember two years old. Well, I do. Um, and I recall my whole family sitting in our living room. Um, so I have, I have two older sisters, uh, my mom and my dad, um, and they had just recently bought something large, an appliance of some sort or a TV. So that part I don't really remember, but there was a very large box in the, um, in the living room. And in my active imagination, which I've always had, um, I imagined that I could jump backwards into this box. And before anybody could stop me, um, or my, or I myself <laughs> could stop myself, I attempted to jump backwards into this box and I went forward into a, uh, coffee table that, um, had sharp corners and a glass top and I hit my head and I cracked it open and I still have the scar right up here. Um, and I just remember just, just the, sh the, the look of like, ah, on everybody's face, like in the, almost like a slow motion as it was happening in that moment of thought, as I was kind of going forward that maybe this wasn't the best idea. <laughs> Um, and, um, and then the panic that ensued because of course I did, couldn't see what happened, but, um, slowly the pain started to kind of set in and, and the, and the fact that everybody in the room was like, oh, um, because I was bleeding and, um, my one sister is not very good with blood at all. And, and I am the, I am by far the youngest in my family, or at least at that time I was, um, because my, my parents were considered older parents when they had me, my sisters, um, or half sisters, and they're 13 and 15 years older than I am. So much, much younger. So anyways, um, that's, that's my earliest 
memory and kind of dealing with the the aftermath of that and going to the hospital and getting stitches and you know nursing and staff and doctors trying to calm me down um and then dealing with the stitches and af- after that and um i was very clumsy um so because a- after that fact i ended up hitting my head again um a few times unfortunately um and looking back on that now, <laughs> because I had no, and I don't even know if my, I don't even know what my parents thought at the time, but I didn't know I had a concussion. Um, I remember some of the pain and the headache from it and, um, and that shock of that moment, like kind of sparking, you know, my memories and and staying with me all of this time and i sometimes i wonder i'm like how does how did that mesh with my neurodivergence you know how did it um add to that um and it because it wasn't until i was about 40 um that a doctor finally said to me after going over my history my medical history um, and I started there. Uh, they said that was a traumatic brain injury. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't realize. I didn't realize that because nobody else had. And then that sort of kind of sets up the rest of the rest of everything, I suppose, because um, I in in doing that in in hitting my head when I was two, I I broke the inside of my nose at the top on the and um it created a deviated septum and after that point I I was a very sick kid very often I would get pneumonia and I would get bronchitis and sinus infections and all of this sort of thing um and I wear glasses I'm wearing contacts right now and I don't so I don't know exactly how much of that maybe could have been a factor at all um And then going to school, um, I struggled a lot. Um, And I remember having a lot of testing done. There was a lot of testing done on me. Um, I remember being pulled from class a lot in in the early grades, but ultimately I was was, um, held back in grade one. I was failed Um, and that stuck with me for a very long time because I, I was a, in my head. I was a failure, I, and and then that kind of made me want to um, prove myself and make up for that, and over try to overachieve, and and um, and it was very awkward. And I have sorry, my dog just barked. I have dogs, so hopefully they don't. <laughs> um, so that's sort of that's what I remember early on is that there were there were things that happened to me that weren't um, realized or recognized by myself by my parents by my teachers by my doctors Um, and you know what what would it have been like had it been addressed in the way that we address these things now traumatic brain injuries and the protocols that go along with that um, you know proper assessments for um, neurodivergence. I did find myself eventually in classes with um, other children that um, I knew were uh, sort of di- like smart. <laughs> and I always remember thinking, I'm like, why am I here? Because I failed. Um, and that was what I had in my head. But um, so I didn't quite understand how I fit in, fit in with that group. Um, so it was a very kind of awkward childhood to a certain extent up until I eventually, you know, went to university and I felt that was kind of a fresh start, start over. Um, but still I was striving and I was trying super, super, super hard. Um, and, uh, and then eventually came to that point where it's like, Hmm, what if, and then the, and then I started asking those questions and got, um, my diagnosis and it that clicked that made a lot of sense (laughs) i've been smiling all the time that you've been telling your story because it gives me such a sense of community to see all of us 
late diagnosed people coming together and sharing our experiences. You mentioned you thinking that you could jump backwards into the screen. I have a memory when I was very young, I'm not sure what age, I was riding a chairlift with my dad and it was an open chairlift. So he was mm -hmm. like holding me yes. and I looked down and it just, I still remember that feeling like it was just open and you know the sky and everything was so beautiful and I told my dad dad that I want to jump and he looked at me and for a moment he thought that I actually was and to be honest I think that if he hadn't stopped me I would have jumped because in my mind I was you know at that point so like I don't know there was some sort of a determination in me that I can do it. Yeah. Um, and so I was very bold in that way. And then you mentioned being clumsy and all. And I remember that I, you know, for the love of God, I could not <laughs> touch a ball. <laughs> I, 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 I was talking to Jamie Heddle, um, the articulate um, autistic. I don't know if you know about her or not, but she's amazing. And I was uh, doing an interview with her and I told her that, you know, when, when, you know, my, my sisters and my cousins, they were very good at sports and all. And I wouldn't be able to look up in the sky or track the ball or, you know, kind of like track the movement and all of that. And she said, you know, well, there's actually a name for that. And I was like, really? And she said, well, I, I, I still have trouble pronouncing it, but it's kind of like um, proprioception. I think I hope I got it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there are so many things uh, but because autism and ADHD is so stigmatized and expected to be presented in a certain manner mm -hmm. that I, uh, you know, uh, honestly, even if I, at that time I had a clue, I wouldn't have believed that because the, the you know, the belief about these uh, neurological variants is so stigmatized. Yeah. But um, enough about me, we're going <laughs> to, you know, um, but you know this this makes me excited whenever anybody oh. shares I, I, i'm like oh my god this happened to well, me it's, too. it's yeah it's a sense of community and it's like oh i'm not alone i'm not yes. alone in that exactly. it's not just me being this like whatever it is i'm doing and um you know i'm not alone I, that's that's yeah I so <laughs> that. <laughs> yes and if you all don't know about autism wish it's run by leah mccabe um it's a wonderful organization as well. Please check them out. Moats place the page. Uh, they are amazing to check their pages out, y'all. I love our community. I love everyone who's a part of our community. Um, Tara, I wish my mom was here because the amount of times I've told her, I think I was born on the wrong planet. Oh. <laughs> That that all makes sense now. And talking to you, I just feel like, you know, so excited. But, um, you know, um, I, th I think we touched on your childhood and, um, you know, indications of neurodivergence in your childhood. I actually didn't know you were neurodivergent um, even after following your page. And then yeah. I came across and I was following your page um, for a very long time because I resonated so strongly with rabbit and bear. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a feeling, I was like the author <laughs> in some way, but you know, you can't really ask people, you don't know how much knowledge mm -hmm. they have of neurodiversity and how they would, you know, uh, appreciate an unsolicited feedback. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, I didn't know at that time. And then I came across a post where you shared your neurodivergence and you also shared your cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so if, if it's not too triggering for you, would you like to share more about that? How did that diagnosis impact you? Were there any um, aspects of your neurodivergence that came into play with your treatment and your diagnosis and the way that you handled everything all together? Mm -hmm. um, I think, it's odd because I mean, we live inside our bodies and we, we become very familiar, you know, with things and, um, but it, I didn't, I didn't feel necessary. It was normal, I guess, I guess is that things became normal to me that maybe should not have been normalized. Um, because there just wasn't an, an awareness in it and anyone, um, 
so I, I talked about that, you know, the, the deviated septum and that I had from the, the fall I had when I was two. Um, that was finally addressed when I was around uh, 25, I suppose. And um, that made a world of difference in um, my health. I wasn't getting sick anymore, um, you know, every year with, with um, you know, pneumonia or, or bronchitis. And it, it just sort of, that sort of set something in me off as well. It was like, okay, so if this, this has been causing all of these problems, what else could possibly be going on with me that has been missed? Um, because doctors were treating me for everything but what was actually wrong. Um, and I started to notice um, from, you know, my, my about 25 um, onward that I was being triggered by eating certain foods, like heavy f foods, um, and that sometimes I felt very tired. Um, other times I felt extremely energetic um, and I could, I could lose weight easily sometimes, other times not, not so much. Um, I, would, I would gain weight and I, I would wonder why. And kind of going, you know, along this journey was were my parents, um, and my dad, uh, throughout his life, had different health issues, and so I'm kind of watching what you know what they're doing or not doing, or you know maybe what they could do better. And he had thyroid, um, a thyroid condition, um, not really my my mom, and uh, I'm vexatious. Um, and so again, I'm carrying on with my life. I, I, I got married, um, and I found myself, um, uh, pregnant and, and then, and then I wasn't, I miscarried and I remember, you know, seeing the doctors in the aftermath of that and all kinds of tests were being done and all kinds of blood work and this and that. And at one point, some doctor did say something to me about my thyroid levels seemed a bit strange, but then the next time I went and everything was fine, um, the blood work came out fine. Um, but again, these, these highs and lows in my, my how, in my, how I felt like the, the tired versus the hyper versus that was all kind of going, that was going along with everything else. And um, in 2011, my dad um, passed away. So I, I had, I had the miscarriage in, in 2009. Um, and that sort of, I, I pinpoint as around the time and I was married in 2007. So maybe around that time there was some stress <laughs> entering my life. Um, so from about 2009 until 2013, it was a roller coaster of emotions. Um, because following my dad's passing, um, I found out that my mother's, my mother had cancer, my mother had um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, but she went into remission. Um, but following my dad's passing a week, just a week after, we found out that her cancer had returned. And not long after that, my family doctor kind of tilted her head like this and looking at me in, in my yearly physical and said, something looks wrong with your thyroid. It looks enlarged. So that at that point they could actually see it, even though it was still very contained. But my blood work wasn't showing anything. Um, so then I was sent to a specialist. And within that year, um, I was told that I needed, or I should have surgery to um, remove my thyroid. And I had something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And there's a couple of, it's an autoimmune disease. There's a, a couple of autoimmune diseases that can affect a thyroid. There's Graves disease, there's Hashimoto's. And Hashimoto's, um, it's your, your body is attacking 
um, itself that, and my thyroid, which is why they couldn't see it, was going back and forth between being hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. And it went on this, this path until finally it had kind of run, ran itself out and it, and it killed my thyroid. And unfortunately, by the time they found it, it was, it was, it was too late. Um, and so I agreed to have the surgery in 2012 to remove, um, to remove my thyroid. And it's, at this point, there's, they were still saying it's not cancer. Um, they'd done all kinds of biopsies and scans and ultrasounds and everything, blood work and everything came back that, um, it wasn't cancer. Um, following the removal of my thyroid, um, it, it was cancer. It was, I was told it was loaded with, with cancer. I think the weight hadn't spread. And, uh, but I found myself without, without a major organ that controls so much of your body's you know, hormones and then, and then pr living in a body as well that I was, I guess I, I didn't truly understand because I also hadn't been diagnosed yet with, with, um, with, you know, my neurodivergence. And, um, so I was, these pieces of a, the puzzle were slowly starting to kind of come together in a, in a way. Um, but it would still be a few years before it sort of really started to kind of gel. Um, but then my, so my treatment, um, so the removal of my thyroid was 2012, the treatment, which was radio, uh, I had to swallow radioactive iodine. Um, that was in January of 2013. And then you go into isolation in the hospital for a few days. And, uh, and then following that you, you come out and you have a, like a full body scan and, uh, it showed <clears throat> that everything at that point was clear. Um, but I came out as well to my mom being, um, being in her last months of life. Um, and I also, I lost, I lost my job at that time too. I, um, it, it was, so it was a lot of loss. It was a lot of change. It was a lot of realizations about, um, you know, I was, I was separated from my marriage. i I uh, had miscarried. I lost my job. Um, I started a new relationship. Um, I moved a couple of times. Um, you know, lost my dad, and then and then I found myself in this world of you know not knowing exactly where my health stood, um, and then and losing my mom, who was my my best friend and my biggest cheerleader and and I still want to cry about it now even though it's it's been you know 10 over 10 years it was it was a lot a lot to process and I I don't I didn't give myself time to do that I didn't there was part of me that didn't didn't want to I just wanted to keep running keep going um, instead of sitting there and thinking about everything that was so changed in such a, a short amount of time, and it, it was extremely, extremely overwhelming. Um, and, and I didn't have, I didn't have my, my, my sisters and I, um, were not in a good place, um, relationship wise, following the death of our parents, we didn't see to eye to eye on certain things. So um, I found myself without them to to lean on. Um, so where where I thought I would have my family, I didn't. Um, but I did have a new partner who was very supportive. I, I do have very close friends. Um, I did find you know, I did find other f family and 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 um, uh, places and, and ways to um, to get some support, um, including therapy, um, from very early on. So, uh, in in my late high school years, I I found that I was really struggling, and um, at that point, they seemed to catch up with me um, and offered social workers to help me. And um, from that point on, 
I would, I would seek out therapy whenever I felt I couldn't handle things on my own. Um, and I found that extremely beneficial and I continue to, to go to therapy even now, whenever I, I think it's like, okay, I think it's time to go and talk about this or that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think all along, like the neurodivergent, like my autism, my ADHD, it was there, <laughs> but I wasn't pulling it in as a part of that, that puzzle just yet. And, uh, but I was wondering, I'm like, what's going on? And, you know, is, you know, I'm, yeah, it was just, it was very, it was very difficult and very overwhelming, but, and it, and it's almost, it was fast. <laughs> it seemed it was only five years and all of this happened. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like I'm in a better, much better place now. Um, and, the, and I wish that some of those things hadn't happened. I, I wish that I could still have some of those people in my life. Um, but I'm glad that I've kept kind of asking the questions and diving deeper into certain areas to kind of put the pieces of myself back together, because I don't know if I ever really had them from that, the start. <laughs> that makes, um, you know, number one, thank you for being so raw and real with us. It, it, it must have been triggering for you. Um, I appreciate you sharing all of that. Um, you know, it is important to share stuff like this, in my opinion, for two reasons. Number one, a lot of us who have been undiagnosed since our childhood, we don't realize that there are different aspects of neurodivergence that, you know, play a role in our health. For example, interoception, we can't always tell what, you know, our body needs. No. Um, and therefore, we deprive our body of that. Um, and pain sensitivity, for some people, something might not be that painful, but for us, it might be excruciating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some people, something might be excruciating. And for us, that may be normal. And that kind of like all of these certain aspects um, kind of make the doctor miss a lot of things. Um, yeah. Another one of our similarities, Tara, I also have Hashimoto's. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I thyroid, the right part is slightly enlarged, not a lot. But I know when you say, you know, feeling energetic, and then back yes. to, you know, I can relate to all of that. Yeah, um, it's, uh, you know, you've been through so much and rabbit and bear shows that and it shows that very simply and that's the beauty of it because when you read it every person can live through their own lived experience um i um rofe um at that time when you said good morning um uh, Tara was sharing her story with us, so I did not say good morning to you, but good morning. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. Um, and uh, Tara Vexatious um, has a comment for you. Uh, can you see the comments on the screen? Um, this is, I can relate to that. Is there... Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's move on. And if anybody's wondering, why do I take pauses? I do have a script with me. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, I forget stuff and then I get confused. So I thought um, I would not make things awkward and just keep a script with me. <laughs> so um, I think that pretty much answers the next question. How did rabbit and bear come into existence, right? Uh, because I, I feel like all of this, uh, all these losses, it, it was kind of like your um, your outlet. That's, that's what it makes me feel. Yeah. Um, how did how did you feel when kind of like you started illustrating and writing and putting it into like text relief and i and i may start to cry now i can feel it coming up, up on me um but i it was 2019 spring of 2019 when i finally thought or had the idea to sit down and um write about it and draw Writing has always been something I've, I've done since um, I was a child. I always liked to write stories and 
fant- read books and, and um, you know, put these fantastical stories together. And that was something my dad was good at. He was a good storyteller. Um, and so that was something I always wanted to do was be a writer. So I would write poems. I would write stories. I would write about my feelings. And it was always something that therapists recommended as well. Write, write it out. And it was very cathartic. It would be, sometimes it wouldn't make sense at all, (laughs) but I, you know, to write about things, just get it out there was helpful. So I knew, I knew that was, I knew that was good therapy for me. But I also, I've liked to do art over the years, but I've never really considered myself an artist. But I had this idea to, to put it together um, because drawing in, in the past as a child, I, I found it um, comforting and it would relieve stress and it would bring focus, just like exercise. I still do exercise because it helps, you know, I go for a run and it, it brings focus to my, my brain. And, and I certainly was dealing with a lot of anxiety um, and, and depression as well. But anxiety, I felt, you know, this, this buildup inside of me. And um, leading up to that moment before I sat down, um, I hadn't been working. So when I lost the job back in 2012, be- which was because of my diagnosis, I was missing a lot of work. Um, and because of my mom as well, um, I really struggled to get back to work. It was triggering. Um, I just didn't know how to fit in. So uh, attempting to go back to work and being around people who weren't understanding maybe me, um, and I wasn't really understanding me either, I guess. Um, I was, I was really struggling, but it was becoming apparent in, in our my relationship, my home, that I needed, we needed to do something. I was going to have to go back to work because we needed the, the money. And in that very moment before I sat down, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to do something, but I don't need to do it right now. I can start slowly. I can send out resumes, do this or that. But in this, this very moment, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to draw. And for whatever reason, I had this idea that I could draw rabbits. Um, And I even had this kind of flash of an idea of what it was I wanted it to say. And, um, and so that's, that's what I did. I, I sat down at my dining room table, I looked at photographs of rabbits on Pinterest. And I had a sketch paper, or I actually didn't even have sketch paper at that moment. I had notebook paper, <laughs> the lines, and I had a pen. And I just started, I just started drawing. And um, by the end of the afternoon, by the time my, my partner at the time, by the, he came home, I had three of these rabbit drawings done. And he was like, you did that? <laughs> He's like, these are great. And I was like, really? And it was kind of a boost to my, to my, um, my self-esteem. And I'm like, okay, I'll share this. At that point, I was in a little, I was in a writing group on online, and so I shared it. And they were like, this is, this is lovely. We love this. And so then I, I started to make it part of my, my daily routine. I would do at least one rabbit and have it say something. And, um. Maybe I'd do more than that, but it became part of my routine and it was building me up and it was an outlet. So it was calming me down. It was bringing focus and it was also letting me process these, this, these years, like a lifetime's worth of big feelings and emotions that I had over these losses. Um, and the more I could simplify it, those thoughts so that they would just, you know, end up in like a line or two of dialogue between rabbit. And at the start, it, rabbit talked to different animals and insects and butterflies and things like that. Um, the more I could kind of boil that down into one image and short amount of dialogue, um, th- the better it made me feel that and, and kind of brought that understanding, you know, full circle in me 
um, and then I'd share it. And um, initially it wasn't kind of hitting a mark. Like there were people that liked it, my friends, my family, the, the kind of, you know, standard, um, like, oh, that's lovely. We like this. Um, but it wasn't until March of 2020 that I thought to start sharing or the, the new year, January, February of 2020, that I started sharing rabbit, some of my rabbit and bears again, um, because I kind of slowed down with it because it didn't seem like the interest was there. Um, except for me, <laughs> I was doing them, but now I still do them for me. Um, but in, as we know, in, in 2020, some things changed in our world and, uh, there seemed to be a lot of people who were experiencing anxiety. Um, and one particular, uh, drawing that I, and dialogue I did between rabbit and bear where, where rabbit said, um, I'm afraid. Um, that went viral and, and yeah, that, that was, and me, that draw, that image that went viral, that was me trying to tell my partner what it was that I needed from him when I was feeling scared or afraid. He wanted to fix things. He wanted to do something tangible that would make me feel better. So, um, but there wasn't, there was, there was nothing. It was, it was me. I needed to work through that, but to have him there or any of my friends, like, you know, it's, I need, I, it's nice, you know, just be here with me, hold this space. So that, that was, that was the inspiration behind that. And there's inspiration of course, behind every single one of them. And, and um, yeah, it just rabbit and bear have been my outlet. They have become my way of having back some of what I lost uh, with my parents um, and relationships, um, the, the child I lost. Um, and it, but it's me also at the core of it. And as, as, you know, as painful as it might be in certain aspects, it's also beautiful, Tara, mm -hmm. you're beautiful inside and out. Um, and one of the things that you've talked about, which is really important for our community to hear and which you did probably unconsciously, um, when you took a pause and you said, well, you know, I don't need to do this right away. I will pause and I will draw. Those are the boundaries and self-care that all of us need to establish in our lives because we need that. Yeah. You know, we, one thing that I've noticed about neurodivergent people, whether they are diagnosed or undiagnosed, we go out of our way to make everyone feel comfortable we go out of our way to kind of, you know, uh, make anyone and everyone else happy, but we don't extend the same grace to ourselves. And in that moment, what you did was you extended that grace to yourself. And look how beautiful it turned out to be. Look how that changed, you know, things around for you. And this is what I want for us to realize for our entire community that, you know, do that for yourself. The effort that you put into others, make that same effort for yourself. And you've shown us, you've shown us through your writings and through the power of your words, what a major difference it can make. Um, you know, I could go on and on <laughs> talking to you, um, but at the same time, we only have around 17 minutes left. Sure. Um, but you know, it's the the ADHD and autism part of it. I would like to kind of like touch a little um, on that as well. So um, my ADHD brain and autistic brain are sometimes kind of like going in opposite directions, <laughs> and um, it's you know. Um, what about you? Are there any certain instances, you know, and I love the way my brain works, yeah. but sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it is not a bed of roses. Let me just phrase it that way. Mm -hmm. So would you like to share a couple of like, um, you know, experiences 
sure. because I, I I remember you shared that you're autistic and you have ADHD too, so you're yeah. an ADHD or like yes <laughs> me and some of our wonderful community members here. So yeah. share how that has impacted sure. in terms I, of you too. I do. Yeah. I just I want to go. I want to touch on something you said about not realizing, you know, that we're deserving of yes. Um, and I see that as kind of that disconnect where we think we're not deserving um, of s certain things. And I certainly felt that way. And it wasn't until I was around between 35 and 40 and I sat down having gone through, so maybe closer to 40, gone through all of these losses and all of this sort of stuff. And I, and then it was causing a strain on my relationship at the time. And um, I sat down with a therapist and he asked me, you know, what was going on and I told him <laughs> and he just said, hold on a second. You went through all of that in five years or less. That's a lot. That is a lot. And you are allowed to like, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder you are struggling. Yes. Um, and at that point, it still wasn't. A, a diagnosed yet with um with adhd or autism but uh but yeah that was the first time someone said like that's a that's a lot you're allowed to step back and you need some time to process this um but uh but yeah skipping skipping forward to you know i, I was diagnosed with adhd first um, and it, and it made sense looking back. I thought, I thought ADHD had more to do with, um, I guess the stereotypes were filling my head of what that looked like the same with autism to some extent. Um, but a friend of mine, her son was being, um, diagnosed. He was going through that process. And I remember she was talking to me about it and I'm like, I relate to that and I relate to this. And then, and then, so the, those pieces were coming together. So ADHD was first and then I was diagnosed with autism and yes very much I understand what you're saying about they sort of like fight each other and <laughs> so it's a constant um daily battle I feel to try and <laughs> keep them um working together because sometimes they can work <laughs> together instead of fighting each other um and I feel like right in this moment <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of in going I'm doing okay <laughs> um I I find that most days um because there's a lot of things I want to do right I want to I want to be creating rabbits and bears I want to be writing other stories um and taking part in other you know parts of life um, but, uh, in the morning, often I find I've got all of these thoughts in my head and it could be very easy to be distracted and go in, in 12 different directions all at once, um, or just completely zone out, um, and disassociate into my phone or whatever. And, you know, you find yourself scrolling or, or whatever that is. Um, and so I find that, um, if I can get some exercise in in the morning, which for me translates to the treadmill, um, that's the one thing I can kind of hold myself <laughs> to. Um, it's easy and I'll, I'll go for a run. And as I'm doing that, I can, I have all, you know, my thoughts are cycling and, and I'm thinking, you know, about the things I want to accomplish and, and stories that I'm working on. So even if I'm not sitting down and, and that's something I've had to learn as well, that uh, it, writing <laughs> isn't always sitting there in front of your, your laptop or your computer typing on the, the keys or, or writing out in a, in a notebook. Um, it is that too, but I have also spent a huge amount of time inside my head um, when I've been think working on a story, like, okay, there's there's a story, here's the pieces of that puzzle, um, and there's there's a roadblock or I've got writer's block, um, how, I'm, how am I going to work through that? So I sometimes think a lot about that when I'm on, when I'm running, 
I just sort of, I have that moment where I can just zone out. My body's getting tired. My, my mind is working and, and focusing and zeroing in on what it is that I actually, you know, want to do when I get off the treadmill. Um, I, I, you know, I do have, I do have thoughts about like long-term goals, but to get to those long-term goals, it's kind of chipping away at it bit by bit instead of it seeming like this huge insurmountable thing. It's like, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get to this point of having a novel or a, or a book? Um, I just try and think in smaller, smaller steps, step by step. And um, so, yeah, if I, if I can, if I can hold myself to that um, kind of process which I have been successfully for the last month. <laughs> um, I, I'll work out and then I'll, I'll go to work on, on, you know, writing or creating new rabbit and bear, or um, it's part of my routine. And um, I like that routine. Obviously things come along that can throw it off course, which sometimes that part of my brain isn't very happy about whatsoever. Um, but I, I do know that that period of time in my life, maybe my entire life, but it really sort of zoomed in on it when I was going through all of those losses and things. I, I saw that things could go wildly off track, but bit by bit, by taking those steps and asking those questions and seeking out the right help and finding the right friends to right. have around me yes. the right you know group and community um that i have now um i could i could get back on track it didn't have to be a complete and utter disaster um so yeah that i i try to have my routine <laughs> and <laughs> i'd like to share something that i really really struggle with here um you know for me, task initiation and continuing with a task is like a huge part of my ADHD that comes into play. And my autistic self, I need routine in order to be able to do that, right? Yeah. And so um, before I got up, you know, um, on the ADHD meds, I felt like I was sinking mm -hmm. because I would just do things that are very simple for everyone around. Um, and I'm sure most of you um, who are my tribe now are going to understand that, that things that are very simple for people around me, like doing the dishes, regular executive function stuff, getting the kids ready, getting their lunches ready, getting them to school. I need breaks in between yeah. every little thing. Rewards. And, yes. Oh. <laughs> exactly. And I, I can't like, no matter how much I want to, or I need my brain to, it doesn't work the way that, you know, a lot of people around me, like they do for them, just getting the school, uh, the kids to school and everything. It's like this. For me, I feel a sense of accomplishment when I do that, you know, like, yeah. I did it. Like I yeah. actually give myself a pat on the back that I yeah. did it because it's a huge accomplishment for me. Yeah. So now what I've started doing is that, you know, I have a, this little, and I'm just sharing that because if you guys have somewhat of a shared, you know, challenge with me here, I, ha I, I got myself a little dice and it has all these little tasks mm -hmm. mentioned, doing laundry, doing dishes and stuff like that. So I play a little game with me to trick my brain. <laughs> And so I roll the dice <laughs> and so whatever, you know, uh, comes on the dice and then I do that task and I'm like, okay, turn two and I do that. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that to see, you know, if anybody, uh, you know, wants the dice or anything like that, that mm -hmm. is available out there and I can share the link too. Um, but yeah, um, I think Tara, we're, um, I respect your time and I already, oh. you've done us such a huge favor um because i'm we're all all our team at the kind theory are huge fans oh, um so we we weren't really expecting this and it oh. happened we're very grateful for you oh. uh, but that being said <laughs> most says that uh, they cheat 
the dice game some days. <laughs> now you've given me an idea. So yeah, I do lists. I write lists, but then sometimes if I do something and it's not on the list, I write it on there and then I cross it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's my way of cheating the lists. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Vex, for sharing that. And, um, thank you, Rofe. I mean, you know, when when I started Kind Theory, at that time, uh, my therapist had recommended, because my son was already uh, diagnosed autistic, and my therapist was like, she was trying to convince me to get um, an evaluation done. Mm -hmm. So um, she said, you know... I have a very strong feeling. Why don't you get uh, it done? And evalu getting an evaluation is not that easy, no. uh, especially if you're doing it privately. It's expensive no. and there are a lot of factors. And then there is another aspect of it, the emotional and moral toll that it brings because everybody around you has seen you grown up and you came unidentified. And now suddenly you release this new information. And so there's all kind of feedback and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, <laughs> my therapist, so we started Kind Theory, and at that time, I never felt like I belonged. And then I came to this community, and Tara, let me tell you, they are all so loving, so open-hearted, and um, I am minority of the minority of the minority, I like to say, <laughs> because I'm a South Asian brown autistic and ADHD women who wears a hijab. I'm a Muslim. And they welcomed me with open arms. There is no judgment. Mm -hmm. We respect each other. We are kind to each other. We listen to each other and we relate to each other. So I found my tribe through Kind Theory. And I just, you know, this is kind of like my passion now. Yes. And so just one last question leading from all that I shared with you. Yes. What are your plans for going into neurodiversity advocacy and getting involved with organizations like ours, if any? <laughs> if any. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm open to it all ever, uh, ever since I self-diagnosed um, at first and I started seeking um, community. Um, I've, I've been open to talking about it and learning, um, and being part of different, um, events. Um, and after following my official diagnosis, I, I, back in 2020, 2021, um, I've talked a couple of times with different organizations and I'm certainly open to that and I'm open to um to that work through rabbit and bear as well um, because part of it I see as um there's that stereotype and there's the the misinformation out there and I I, I kind of, there is a part of me that likes it when people are like, oh, I didn't realize you were, I'm like, well, that's because it's not just this one thing. <laughs> it can be, it's, 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 and I love that illustration that goes around that, you know, it's not a linear um, spectrum. It's, it's, it's round and it can be so many different things and different things depending on the, the day or the time of day like it, it, it can fluctuate um but i like kind of breaking down that um those stereotypes and and being yeah see see me see us <laughs> yes <laughs> and i think you're already doing that because a lot of people a lot of neuro um divergent people when they read your story even without you telling us that you're neurodivergent yeah. we can already tell <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um i think um to wrap it all up um if anyone has any question for tara please do share um that's a yes that's yeah lex you actually nailed it by saying that that's a clinical diagnosis for me it played an important role with imposter syndrome too because yeah. i had started doubting 
<laughs> what I was feeling or going through. Yes. So yeah, that that's another very, aspect of it as well. Very validating. And yeah, for sp having spent so many years, like, not on the right path and being being labeled all of the wrong things because yes. that gets on my nerves as well because I've heard that quite a bit and I think maybe we all have it's like oh I don't like labels mm -hmm. I'm like you know what I really dislike labels too the wrong ones the wrong I'm, ones really I'm gonna choose my own labels <laughs> yeah exactly they can be very validating and helpful um so yeah and and, and but again it is it is very difficult for some to access assessment and so self -ass self assessment, I do see as a valid. Yes, very valid. We thing. we do too. Yeah, I know, um, Aisha. Um, I think we had some uh, pieces from Rabbit and Bear that we wanted to kind of wrap this whole session up with. Um, Aisha, are you? I know you've been getting internet issues. Mm -hmm. um, if you're online right now, um, could you say something so we know that you're here? Okay, I think she's having internet issues. Uh, I'm here. Oh, you're I'm here. here. Okay. Do yeah. you have uh, the piece that you wanted um, to share? Um, just give me a second. I have saved it. Just give me one minute. Okay. All right. I am going to share mine, and uh, because it has my favorite word in it, um, so kindness, love, and acceptance. Said there. That's what's it. That's what it's all about. That's all, asked Rabbit. That's everything, said Bear. And that really is everything. <laughs> it is everything. I mean, it. you perfectly said it. Nothing goes beyond that when you mm -hmm. are at the level where you can extend kindness and acceptance yeah. and love to someone. Yeah. It's going to be... <laughs> You know, if an ideal world existed, that what it would look like, that's what it would yeah. look like. Yeah. So, yeah, that was my favorite. Is there um, any? Yes, Aisha. Um, I have mine. I yeah. saved it. I think it's one of the first ones that I actually read. Uh -huh. And that is one of the reasons why I said I want to read the book. <laughs> oh. so, so it's like, it goes like, am I broken? Ask rabbit. Uh -huh. No, said beer your healing and healing can be messy and it takes time. Sometimes it might feel like you're broken, but that's just a rough edge being soothed as it grows and fits into a new place. Soon mm -hmm. you'll be stronger than you were before. And I just want to tell you how, just like it was making you emotional while you were talking about rabbit and beer, it just makes me really emotional as well whenever I'm, I read these codes and you know excerpts from it. Mm -hmm. It's just, <laughs> it just resonates so well with me. That one, that one still, that one actually I, I updated um, a little while ago and there was some controversy over that one, the I, I'm, am I broken? Um, because at the end I, I had this I, about being stronger than I was before. And um, in, I redid it and I took that last part out about being stronger. Um, because now I'm not going <laughs> to, it, I do, I guess I do feel stronger. There is that resilience. Um, but I, I don't want to necessarily sometimes put that emphasis on it because we, we do things sometimes because, you know, we have to, we have to, like, what else are we going to do? But if we could have it another way. Um, would we do it that way? And of course, of course we wouldn't. Um, I would give back some of that strength um, to have some things back in my, in my life. Um, but most definitely, yeah, that, that's that soothing of those pieces and fitting them back in, into place and, and rebuilding. Um, yeah, that one's still really close to my to my heart and um the the one that the uh the kindness and acceptance i just did that one this week and um i'm like why didn't i do this one before <laughs> like that's what it is that is what it's all about um 
that's what we all, those are things that we all want. So like, yes, there are other things. There are many other things that, you know, can go into making, you know, a life. Um, but at the core of it, I do. Yeah, we want love. We want acceptance. Um, we want, you know, kindness and, and to give it in return. Like that's, that's huge. And you'd think that these basic things will just already be there, right? You you think that the you would think you would hope. You would (laughs) hope, yeah. When you don't you don't see it, I I guess that that gets to me sometimes. I I I don't I don't understand. I mean, I understand. I have empathy. I have understanding for all of the different journeys that each of us are traveling. Traveling, um, what's happened. In everybody's past but I think if if it were possible for each of us to have that moment to sit there with ourselves with our thoughts and everything that's happened in our lives then yeah that's that's it we, we want that we want love we want love for ourselves we want to give love we want kindness for ourselves we want to hopefully be kind to others we want acceptance for ourselves and wouldn't it be lovely if we could grant that to to everyone else because we're all just here trying (laughs) i would like to think (laughs) we're all here trying um i realize you know the reality of that but you know hey everyone has their own battles to fight um you know nothing what the other person um is going through and i'd like to read out of vex's comment here we often feel like there had to be something gained from our suffering when we first start unpacking of the pain so we yeah. call ourselves stronger and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's right um and i like moat's view on that too. i was pretty young well i you know but i was fighting that feeling uh a lot so i'm glad that you kind of accepted this and said you know it just hurts yeah. i kind of thought i was like no it's supposed to make me stronger and you know stuff but I feel like we could go on forever and ever <laughs> and ever. But um, I know, Tara, you're on board time here. So I'll be, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you for being so raw and real for us. To all of Tara's followers who sent us messages and were not able to join us, um, If you registered, I will send you the YouTube link uh, to this interview and you can kind of go through that and comment there um, and ask Tara anything and we'll email her if there are any questions. Um, And to the rest of you, to my people, Vex, Rofe, Moat, and everybody else who joined, thank you so very much. Um, it It always makes my day when I get in touch with our tribe and we talk about this and we just, talk things through. Tara, any last parting advice? Oh my goodness. Um, I can't think of anything. <laughs> it's okay. I don't want to. Let's just, uh, so my friend Rofe here, um, we have another friend, Chris Bonello, who is an autistic author too. Mm-hmm. Um, he runs the page Autistic Not Weird. I don't know if you know about him. He wrote a book and uh, every time we have a session with him, Mm-hmm. He kind of has this slogan, and we end it at that. So I think we should use that slogan, united mm-hmm. by our differences. So yeah. I like that. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> let's let's do that. Let's just yeah. say united by our differences. Yay, Rofe. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to end the broadcast now. Thank you. Um, hope to see you all very soon again. Take care. Bye-bye.